I remember my dad's last sentence uh, before he passed. And I asked my dad, hey, what do you want me to do? And he said, just do what's best for your children. That was his, was his last sentence uh, before he passed, actually. Um, and it was unforgettable. Just do what's best for your child. And so I do my best for my child. I've tried my best as a dad. Troy Kotzer is an Academy Award-winning actor. He's acted on Broadway, in hit shows like Criminal Minds, and the award-winning film Coda. But that's not his voice you're hearing. It's his interpreter. Troy is a proud member of the deaf community. He had the support he needed as a child, but he said that's not the case for all deaf children. Most hearing parents of deaf children are not willing to learn sign language, to communicate with their children. Instead, they try and quote unquote, fix them. And so I think it's an important message for families out there to hear. It's not just about deafness, but it just it's about love and communication and caring about what's best for your children. In spite of his solid family foundation, Troy's success didn't come easily. I really wanted to show that we have diversity as and that we are talented deaf actors. We're actors who just happen to be deaf. I just happen to be a deaf man. And I really had to keep the faith through the years. And it was really tough. There was a lot of struggle. That lack of representation impacts not only deaf artists, but the authenticity of the stories themselves. Really, you it's almost impossible to match our authentic performance, if you know what I mean, because we have that entire lifetime of that lived experience. We know all the nuance of that lived experience. And it's not just having deaf actors in front of the cameras. That diversity of experience is vital in all aspects of production. Troy has made it part of his work to ensure that other deaf artists have more access than he did. I want more deaf professionals so I can die with a smile on my face and see that Hollywood's finally improved and there's more room for us deaf professionals to be creative. Welcome Academy Award winner Troy Kotzer to All About Change. And we are also joined by ASL interpreter Justin Maurer. Good to see you. Nice to see you too, Jay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. So Troy, you've mentioned in previous interviews that you've suffered from language deprivation as a child due to lack of ASL. And uh, you say that learning ASL saved your life. What is language deprivation? I'm extremely fortunate. When I was younger, I did not have language deprivation, but I had so many friends that I grew up with who were deaf who happened to have experienced language deprivation. Um, Most hearing parents of deaf children are not willing to learn sign language, to communicate with their children. Instead, they try and quote unquote, fix them. And so if you don't have access to language before you enter elementary school, these children can really be left behind. It's so important to have that language exposure at a young age. And the reason why I say ASL saved my life is because I was able to learn how to read and write, math, and all of the subjects in school basically through ASL. And so ASL is the language that taught me. And ASL is not a written language, but teachers using ASL uh, were able to communicate with me visually. And that's why it was extremely important for me as a child. And it's important for folks to to be aware of that. And over 30 states have recently passed a law saying that children from zero to five must be learning a language before entering kindergarten. I'm very pleased to hear that and hope that it expands to all 50 states. That's wonderful. And um, I wanted to ask you, why do you feel that it is important that hearing people have access and learn ASL? Well, it's a very friendly way to communicate in your environment, wherever you happen to go. Um, I've noticed that ASL is becoming more and more popular at the high school level, as well as colleges and universities. It's being considered as a foreign language in foreign language departments. Or when I go to a restaurant or to Starbucks or the airport, it's so nice to bump into someone who happens to learn sign language in any situation. And so there's less and less emphasis on using a pen and paper or texting on a phone to communicate. So it's wonderful to be bilingual, to have 
English and sign language together and be able to go seamlessly through life that way. ASL is really a gift that folks are able to learn a different perspective. And as deaf people, we have our own culture and we have our own language. And so it's wonderful to increase awareness and for hearing folks to learn our language. And just to be clear, um, ASL is um, for Americans that if you, if I go to another country, let's say Mexico or Canada, well, I don't know about Canada, but if you go to Mexico, their sign language is going to be different than American sign language. Yes, you're correct. Uh, It's a myth that sign language is universal and there's one universal language. There's over 300 different types of sign languages worldwide, uh, including Japan, China, Russia, all over the African and European continents. And it's fascinating. It's truly amazing. But just like spoken languages, every country has its own sign language as well as dialects. And there is one type of international sign language that does exist for international conferences that we've developed so we can understand each other. Um, and, And that is amazing that we're able to communicate worldwide, but folks aren't quite completely fluent in this international sign yet. And American Sign Language isn't standardized either. We have dialects in different states and even different signs um, in different regional areas. And so it's similar to your spoken dialects and accents. You can hear if someone's from the South or from the East Coast or you have a New York accent, we have something similar in sign language. And so we can see that some a deaf person from New York would use a different type of sign than someone from California. So it's nice to have that diversity in America too. That's so fascinating. And I, I did want to tell you that my daughter, who is hearing, did learn ASL in, in high school. Uh, I don't know if she became fluent, but um, I'm so proud that she took that, that course and saw it as something important to study. Absolutely. It's extremely important. I'm so proud that ASL is becoming more and more popular all over the country. And as you mentioned, your daughter is learning sign language. My, my daughter's a real life coda. She's hearing, she's a child of deaf adults. And her first language was sign language before she could speak. And so she was bilingual growing up. And my interpreter, Justin, is a coda too. Um, his parents were deaf and he grew up with sign language as his first language. So I wanted to ask you about uh, entertainment. Um, you've said that in interviews that when you grew up that captioning was not common. Um, what type of entertainment did you were you interested in as a child, and how did you consume that entertainment? When I was younger, TV became my best friend because everyone in my family were hearing, they were busy. Sometimes they didn't really have their skills in sign language quite developed yet. So when I was young, I remember watching Tom and Jerry cartoons because it was visual communication uh, and had a lot of action. Um, Imagine watching something like Godzilla. As a kid, I was like, oh, that's cool. There's so much action in Godzilla. I was looking for something that was fun to watch visually, and that would influence my imagination as a storyteller. And my friends and I told stories to each other, recounting what we had watched. There was no closed captioning, um, but there were silent films, uh, Charlie Chaplin, for example. And in silent films, they'd have these captions pop up so that hearing and deaf audiences could enjoy them. And then when the talkies came out, it, the, the deaf community became segregated, a segregated audience that didn't have any access to TV or film. And we had to wait until the 80s and 90s, really, before access was improved. And now we're able to see all films, just like hearing people can. Um, With our film Coda that was released, it was a perfect example of bringing these two worlds together. And so we were able to share our cultures and our languages in the same place at the same time. And so we were able to gain this mutual understanding. And that's what you saw on screen. And that's what you saw in audiences' reaction to our film. That's so great. We've made so many advances um, that are positive for um, all communities. Uh, I also wanted to ask you, what inspired your interest in performing? Well, when I was younger, as I mentioned earlier, um, from watching Tom and Jerry, imagine reading a book and 
having getting that knowledge and spreading that knowledge. I was spreading that storytelling to my friends on the school bus on the way to the school for the deaf. And all of my friends would laugh and feel good. It was just fun to tell these stories, recounting these Tom and Jerry episodes. So my inspiration began from there and continued through the years. I was really looking for a place where I'd have the opportunity to be an artist or work in TV or film. And I realized that 99.9% of folks working in TV and film were hearing, including the folks at the studio level. So it was nearly impossible for a deaf actor to get these opportunities. And it was really hard for me to find work. So the right place for me to, to work was the theater stage. And then when Marley won the Oscar in the late 80s, it was a huge step for Hollywood. And then after our film Coda, I'm seeing more and more opportunities uh, and awareness in ASL beginning to grow and folks popping up in different TV shows. Um, Alakwa Cox, who's indigenous and deaf, just appeared in uh, Marvel's Echo on Disney+. And so I'm seeing more and more opportunities beginning to grow. That's awesome. Troy, you're from Arizona, and there's been a lot of back and forth about the Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind. Why do you think that school has been under attack? So I grew up attending the Phoenix uh, Day School for the Deaf and Blind. It's under ASDB, the Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind, and that's where I had my first exposure to sign language. And just like I mentioned, uh, learning all of these subjects through education in ASL, and I can't imagine these schools shutting down. Um, as we mentioned, uh, language deprivation and young deaf folks struggling to find their identities. There are so many schools all over the country and all over the state. And so I'm wondering why they've targeted a school that has focused in specific education for the deaf. And I'm concerned about the future of our deaf children. I want them to have access to education in their natural language. I remember meeting these parents that had two young deaf children and who were quite nervous about the threat to Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind. And their parents had learned sign language. They were in tears and so worried about where their daughter could go because these deaf kids need a social environment. And the best place for that for deaf kids is at the School for the Deaf. So my heart goes out to them. So I needed to make my voice heard. And I went to the state capitol in Arizona to help them fight for continued funding for their school. And I'm grateful that the senators there uh, appeared to listen to our voices. It was an interesting experience. And I never thought that we'd have issues like that exist and uh, those types of budget cuts for schools for the deaf. You know, because I'm data, I know what's best for deaf kids, uh, being deaf myself. And regarding why they are trying to threaten the funding for that school is because they're trying to, to put everyone with disabilities into the same category and, and put all disabled kids into some type of statewide special ed program. And so disabled people are not a monolith. We're not all the same. We have different needs. And my wife is an ASL teacher, and she noticed that they sent uh, quite a few special ed kids into her class thinking that ASL would be a great fit for all disabled kids, which, which it isn't. It's just another language, right? And so there needs to be that new type of consideration and way of thinking and improvements that, that we're not a monolith and we have uh, specific needs that schools for the deaf um, are currently fitting. And I hope that uh, the school will not be under threat again. You know, and this happens to be in my hometown when I grew up and it would be heartbreaking to see that school close. So I think it's important that it is their right to have education in their language of ASL, and no one should take that right away. Well, I want to commend you on your activism, and uh, I hope that that the school remains successful and open and, and a resource um, for children who need it. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you think you gained from your time there? The social aspect, obviously, because we were able to communicate in our own language. So we had that mutual understanding. Uh, 24 hours a day, we were able to communicate in ASL. And many kids live in the dorms um, just because 
Uh, kids live all over the state. And so they tend to stay at the school during the week and on weekends go back to their families. And so we had that socialization. We had sports. Um, our coaches were fluent in sign language. Our teachers were fluent in sign language. And so really, that's the best atmosphere. That was the best benefit for me to develop my own identity, my own language, and my skill as a storyteller. That came from socialization with other deaf kids and storytelling on the bus and storytelling on campus, um, rather than having to wait, you know, sometimes days or weeks to even see another deaf person. And so that social aspect, I think, is invaluable. That's great. So I understand you went from um, Phoenix to um, Gallaudet University, which is a university for um, the deaf. What do you think you learned um, from the school in terms of um, studying performing arts? Gallaudet University was a place where everyone from all the schools for the deaf from around the United States are all in one place, like in one fishbowl. Imagine that. It was amazing. And it was an unforgettable experience. And so on the theater stage, everyone signed, including the directors and the actors. And that was my first experience on a production like that. And through the years, I wanted to experience more of the outside world. And really, that's why I would take any roles I could get. And one role was of Mice and Men at Deaf West Theater. And I played the role of Lenny. And it just so happened that this was the only place where they integrated hearing and deaf actors to perform on stage. And I thought, you know, I'll leave Gallaudet just to perform in this Deaf West Theater play in Mice and Men. I'll eventually go back. And I didn't because I got more and more work as an actor in LA with Deaf West Theater. And I didn't want to feel like I was limiting myself. I wanted to have that experience of traveling, learning on the job. And, and that was really a huge uh, benefit for me of being a part of Deaf West Theater was having that real world experience. You know, imagine you're like a, a rat underneath the busy city and you can navigate this busy city. So that was me. I was that rat. And here I am. <laughs> so, Troy, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned that, you know, long before Coda, you were involved with uh, Deaf West Theater, um, which uses both spoken English and ASL. And how did that what was the origin of that coming about? Back in 1971, there's a theater called the National Theater of the Deaf. And that was the one place that was a professional touring theater company where deaf actors had opportunities. And there was a gentleman who was watching these deaf folks signing. And he said, hey, you know, I think hearing people should be able to see how, how this works and have access to these plays as well. So they started as an experiment to have simultaneous voicing on stage with the deaf actors and musicals as well. And so it was great for both hearing and deaf audience members to be able to enjoy watching these plays by having access to both languages simultaneously. And Marley Matlin and I recently hosted the Media Access Awards um, just a few months ago. And that was the first time there were two deaf hosts hosting an award show. And of course, there was nothing wrong with that. How did that work? We had our interpreters simultaneously voice for us at the same time. And so folks that weren't fluent in sign language could also enjoy experiencing us as hosts of this award show. So it was a similar concept on stage. It was no difference. Uh, really, you can watch the sign language and hear the sign language being uh, interpreted at the same time. So we worked together with these hearing voice actors and we had two, it was a marriage between English and sign language. And we just had to learn that dance together on the theater stage. I wanted to ask you about the challenges of collaborating or acting with both deaf and hearing actors. Well, the biggest challenge would actually be syncing up the sign language with the spoken English. So when you read a, a phrase in English, you have a period. And sometimes the signs might be a little delayed or vice versa. Sometimes the spoken English phrase is a little longer than the signed phrase. And so the biggest challenge is how to have that punctuation end at the same time and to have something start and end at the same time seamlessly. So that's the biggest challenge. Um, and it takes time and it takes a lot of rehearsal to get that 
to be as seamless as possible. And most of the time, hearing actors don't have that experience working with the deaf. And so we have a team of consultants who will teach them their lines as well as the translations. And sometimes when the director is watching, if the director happens to be hearing, it just takes time for it to be seamless. It takes rehearsal and then it becomes magic. And it's great for everyone. And the audience has really enjoyed our performances. And, uh, and some of our shows even went as far as Broadway around the world. Uh, there was a play called Big River. And audiences really enjoyed it. And it was a musical <laughs> in sign language. And we toured the world. Um, we went to Japan. We went to all 50 states. We were on Broadway. And there was another play called Spring Awakening that was also on Broadway with hearing and deaf actors working together. And so it was such a rich experience and a great opportunity. So we can find a way to work together. And that applies to film and TV as well. There's always a way to work together and make it seamless. And it's just important that you have a deaf eye or an ASL consultant behind the camera to watch the monitor and make sure the sign language is in frame and the signs are accurate and all of the above. Well, it's obvious that you've put a tremendous amount of work into your craft. Um, and it shows from um, what you have accomplished in, in your career. I want to talk a little bit about casting <clears throat> and what casting has looked like over the course of your career. Uh, maybe you can start by talking about what casting looked like when you first started out uh, trying to get roles. Well, I remember the first time I auditioned and I would be extremely nervous whether there'd be an interpreter there or not. And my second question would be, does this interpreter know anything about this role? Because sometimes they'll just throw an interpreter in without any preparation or experience. And I really want to express myself and the interpretation needs to match the emotions in my signing and my facial expressions. So that was a challenge of how can I be as convincing as possible with some interpreter that I may have never met before. And so I remember my audition for Criminal Minds and a friend of mine read the script and said, hey, there's a deaf role available, Troy. You should audition for it. So I showed up and I saw that there were 15 hearing people in the waiting room. And one person was practicing his signs there and I was looking over at all these folks. And so it seemed like I was the only deaf guy auditioning for this deaf role. And so I auditioned and I, I tried my best and I, I gave it my all. And they didn't really expect that an authentically deaf actor would be auditioning for this. And sure enough, I got the role. And one day you can check it out. It's episode 801. And I play a villain and the police are chasing me. It's a really cool role. I play serial killer. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I want to ask you, what? how did you feel to audition for a role that called for a deaf character and to have non-deaf actors audition for the same role? Well, I just had a question how they were casting. How would they know the difference between a hearing person who's playing deaf versus someone who's authentically deaf? I really hope that they were able to see the difference. So my question was, if I forgot to bring an interpreter and that was too much of a budget for them and this hearing person they could communicate directly with, but how can they tell how good this person is at signing or not or how fluent they are? Um, you know, I, I think that at the time that authenticity wasn't a big deal and it really took time to make that change. And I'm so grateful in our film Coda for our director, Sean Hader, and for Marley Matlin to really fight for that authenticity. Uh, originally, they wanted to use hearing A-list actors for marketing and ticket sales and all that bullshit. And finally, with the, they saw success with true authenticity with CODA, with an ensemble deaf cast who were authentic and won multiple Academy Awards. And so I, I hope that folks value that authenticity. What do roles look like? Or what, what's the availability of roles now for you uh, compared to the early days in your career? It's interesting because I read an article and it was saying that 
our film Coda was a game changer and that it really influenced so many different perspectives of folks at the studios and folks in power who want new stories from new perspectives. And before I became an Oscar award winner, there weren't so many opportunities. And of course, after that, I'm, of course, seeing more opportunities out there like Echo that I mentioned on Disney+. Plus. Um, there was another TV series. Uh, Dahmer had some deaf roles, uh, Dahmer on Netflix. And I'm seeing more and more out there and I'm seeing uh, more deaf characters being developed. And there's a couple of deaf writers in the WGA now that are also writing for that show, Echo. And so now we're starting to see more and more deaf producers, deaf directors. And so I saw a lot of change in the last 10 years and I'm hoping for more. I want more deaf professionals so I can die with a smile on my face and see that Hollywood's finally improved and there's more room for us deaf professionals to be creative. Amen. I hope so. Um, How do you adapt for a role that is not written for a deaf actor, but a role that you want to audition for? Absolutely. Just like I was describing how Deaf West theater worked, we'd adapt so many classic scripts like Streetcar Named Desire, um, Hamlet, and, and all of the above. And as far as adapting a hearing character to a deaf character, let's use Hamlet as an example. So imagine if Hamlet is deaf and his uncle, who is the king, really does not want a deaf person to become king and control the kingdom. And so there's a metaphor there, really. He wants to kill him by poisoning him so that hearing folks can continue to run run things. So think about that. So we make these small adaptations. The only challenge is communication, of course, regarding incorporating sign language and that type of thing. Um, There was a film that I was offered recently, a script, and the script was written for a hearing character or the character I was offered. And we thought of a way to solve this problem. And so if the father is the deaf role, and then there's a daughter that um, is a coda. So think about just a father-daughter relationship and how they would communicate in sign language naturally. And it wouldn't be much of a change. Rather than a phone call, you could change it to be a video phone or a FaceTime. Or if it's too complicated, then you can just move things around and really make the story a bit more, more believable. And so I was in an independent film that was called In Cold Light. And the father role was initially written for a hearing character, and he's a rodeo rider in, in Canada. And this role happened to being a deaf character it's easy to adapt because you just imagine sign language rather than English. And so I was able to play this deaf rodeo rider um, who had a daughter and we communicated in sign language. And so we're submitting to the festivals now. It's in post-production. Um, but it's so easy to make these adaptations. So first of all, I want to I want to wish you um, a lot of success um, with uh, your new film. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the film that made your household name, Coda. Uh, first of all, you mentioned your um, the the importance of having an interpreter who gets your emotions, and I just wanted to say that your acceptance speech at the Oscars, um, as a hearing person listening to your interpreter, I felt your emotion. Don't worry, Marley. I won't drop any f bombs in my speech today. Instead, I really want to thank all of the wonderful deaf theater stages where I was allowed and given the opportunity to develop my craft as an actor. Thank you. In addition to seeing your emotion, I heard your emotion through your interpreter. So I understand the the importance of working with someone who really is able to interpret you emotionally. Um, Let's go back to talk about when you first got the script for CODA. What, what were your first thoughts when you read it? Well, when I first read the script of Coda, I, I thought it was fabulous to finally see vulgar sign language. And I thought, hey, you know what? I think hearing people 
can finally see what vulgar sign language looks like. I thought that was pretty cool. And then the story really touched me and made an impact on me because I really felt like people in the audience need to see that relationship between father and daughter on screen, and they need to see, needed to see that movie. And going out on the fishing boat was a bit difficult. You know, I'm from Arizona. I'm not a fisherman. We don't have an ocean in Arizona, if you know what I mean. And so it was a really challenging role and very fun for me to play the role of Frank Rossi. And so I worked with uh, Marley Matlin and Daniel Durant. And of course, we could interact in our natural language of sign language and share that culture. And so deaf culture really was at the center of the story. And I really wanted this role to allow hearing audiences to become a fly on the wall into deaf culture. And I was, I'm so grateful that uh, it all worked out and that we were able to have that experience. Well, it's a beautiful film. And as someone who grew up in Gloucester, um, I was proud to see a film based in um, my hometown. Um, and someone that grew up in boats, I, I understand it takes a while to get used to. Um, but I wanted to ask you about drawing on real life experiences when you were preparing for this role. Uh, there's a scene where your daughter, the, the actress that's playing your daughter in the film, is a singer and you want to hear or feel um, her singing and you put your hands on, on her throat. And I remember you describing the same experience with your daughter. Oh yes, um, I had some parallel experiences. So my daughter plays the piano and she plays the guitar. And really, I don't know the difference. What's the difference between acoustic guitar and electric guitar? I have no idea. And so I bought her both <laughs> to allow her to play with. And she said, hey dad, come over and you can feel this song. She said, hey, dad, come over and you can feel this song. So I walked over to the piano and I set my hands on top of the piano and I could feel the vibrations from the song she was playing. And when she was younger, I would put my hand on her throat to, to feel the vibrations of her singing. And I had that memory. And so we used that experience of our own personal moments with our kids in that film Coda. That happened pretty frequently. And so, you know, I don't want to take my daughter's passion away. I want her to have that experience, but I need to learn to understand it and learn how to live with it. It's just like if my daughter loves Barbie dolls, I don't know about those types of toys, but I'm, I still had to learn because I had a daughter. And what did it mean to you um, to be the first deaf man to win an Oscar? It felt like a blessing. It felt like all of the chips on my shoulders were evaporating and it was like dust off my back. And I really wanted to show that we have diversity as, and that we are talented deaf actors. We're actors who just happen to be deaf. I just happened to be a deaf man. And I really had to keep the faith through the years and it was really tough. There was a lot of struggle. Um, and it was of course, a once in a lifetime experience. And I think it was really important for young deaf children to feel inspired by that moment too, and the disabled community also. I'm sure you've inspired thousands and thousands of young people uh, with your success and, and have opened the paths for so many people. But maybe we can get back to talking again about why authenticity is important for deaf actors or for um, other actors in the disability community. Unless you find a really wonderful professional liar who can play deaf or disabled, really, you, it's almost impossible to match our authentic performance, if you know what I mean, because we have that entire lifetime of that lived experience. We know all the nuance of that lived experience. And if I look at a hearing person talking, can I just sign what they're saying? It doesn't really make sense, right? I, I think sometimes a hearing person might yell and a person who is hearing playing a deaf role might look at the loud noise rather than know how to behave. So I think there's a lot of nuance with the way that we move our eyes and our bodies and us deaf people just spot that inauthenticity immediately. And of course, we had an ensemble deaf cast with Coda and it was such a different experience uh, in how we behave as deaf people. 
Um, and there's so much nuance there. And, and so I think, you know, I, I recently saw a film called Daruma. I saw it at Slam Dance in Park City. And so they have authentically uh, cast disabled folks in their film, uh, including one in a wheelchair and, and one with uh, uh, who's an amputee. And I think it was it was an amazing film and it was funny. And you saw that authenticity and you see things from a different perspective. You know, I think anyone should be able to become a character who is an actor, but where are those opportunities for those disabled actors? You know, I, I think it's really important to follow the script, follow the story, but also give opportunities uh, to those who are authentically disabled. You know, of course, there's a lot of politics behind casting decisions as well. Exactly. But now you've broken some barriers. Um, you know, you've you talked about in the past that the studios are looking for A-list actors, and now you are an A-list actor. Um, and you've proven that a good film with great acting can be successful, financially successful, and um, receive the awards that it that it deserves. So, do you see that trend continuing to evolve? You know, I've been having a lot of meetings. Um, I can say meetings about over 60 different projects. And so I'm just one actor myself. And sometimes when I'm offered a script, um, these folks are so willing to listen to notes, which I never saw in the past. And so I think that folks are more willing to listen and collaborate and work together in how to improve a story and how to make a story believable. Uh, before I was an Oscar award winner, it was like, who are you? You know, I was definitely an outsider. I was the underdog. Nobody knew about me. But then becoming an Academy Award winner, you see people begin to listen. And so perspectives have begun to change. And I'm so excited to see more opportunities to come. And I'm really hoping that there'll be several deaf roles added to even more stories, too, because we have so many stories to tell. Thank you for your leadership. Um I want to just shift and talk about a documentary you made as a tribute to your father. Can you tell us a little bit about your your dad and your relationship to him? When I look back on being young, I was so grateful to have a father who was included in my life because I happened to be deaf and my father saw that and he understood me. He didn't try and fix me. He accepted me. He learned how to live with me. And he learned sign language. Uh, my father took me out to uh, for so many different activities like camping, sports, water skiing, out in the snow, hunting, all of the above. My dad was really involved in my life when I was a kid. And remember back in the 60s and 70s, uh, there wasn't too much exposure to ASL or sign language. And 98% of hearing parents of deaf children don't know sign language and can't communicate with their own kids. And so I was so grateful to be able to communicate with my parents before I entered kindergarten. And it just so happened that my father was in a car accident when I was a teenager. He was hit by a drunk driver and he became paralyzed from his neck down and lost his ability to sign. So I told myself that it was really important to share this story in my documentary that parents should be included in their children's lives. You know, when you're missing communication, you miss out on so much. Um, being deaf didn't stop me and my father being disabled in a wheelchair didn't stop him. And so I think it's an important message for families out there to hear. Um, it's not just about deafness, but it's just, it's about love and communication and caring about what's best for your children. And, you know, my dad was very busy. He was a police chief and he had to take care of four boys, but he still found the time to learn sign language and socialize with me. And so that's, that's the, uh, our, our documentary in short. I wonder if you could retell um, a very emotional part of the film where you gave a speech at your high school graduation um, and there was a videotape of it and showed it to your father in the hospital. And, and can, if you could describe what his reaction was like. So at my high school graduation, they asked me if I wouldn't mind giving a speech. And I was a bit conflicted because my dad couldn't be there. Um, he was in ICU just two months earlier, um, and he 
still wasn't well enough to be able to come to my graduation. So the idea was floated that my one of my brothers filmed my speech on a VHS camera and so I could bring it to my dad in the hospital. So we did. I gave the speech. Uh, my brother shot it and we brought the VHS tape to the hospital room and we were sitting there. And I was so glad to watch my dad's reaction. And so it was extremely emotional because I wasn't, we, we didn't even know if my dad would survive. And to be able to watch my graduation speech with his own eyes, it was so touching and it meant so much to him to watch that. And it meant so much to me as well. It was just such a beautiful and powerful moment. And I, I understand that even after um, he was paralyzed, he went back to work and he continued his work as the police chief. Yes, he went back to work. Um, he ended up, he worked for a few years at the police, uh, for the police force, and he retired and then became a teacher. Um, he was a professor at a community college in Mesa, Arizona, and he taught criminal justice, uh, law, and so on. He was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, but he didn't let that stop him. So it was so inspiring because he didn't care of what people thought about how he how he looked. He was still able to communicate with his voice. He was still able to teach classes. Um, it was it was a, a big gap having sign language being missing, but he we were still able to develop our own way of communicating, and we were we were able to be equal to just tell our, each other so much and to share our love. Well, he sounds like an amazing person, and I'm so sorry for your loss. Uh, I'm sure he's missing from your life. Thank you. I, you know, I imagine that my dad is, is proud. I remember my dad was pretty worried about me. Hey, Troy, you want to act? You're trying to be in movies. Uh, okay. Just make sure you keep your day job and make sure you graduate from college and get your degree, maybe something like engineering or something like that. But I was pretty stubborn. And looking back, my dad was right. It was a really hard life, <laughs> the life of an artist. And now I can give advice to my daughter in the future and say, hey, make sure you're on the right track. Everything comes around 360. Oh, absolutely. You know, everything that I learned looking back, now I have to be a responsible dad and be a good, good father for, for my daughter. I remember my dad's last sentence uh, before he passed. And I asked my dad, hey, what do you want me to do? And he said, just do what's best for your children. That was his, was his last sentence uh, before he passed, actually. Um, and it was unforgettable. Just do what's best for your child. And so I do my best for my child. I'm trying my best as a dad. I'm really proud of my daughter. Um, she's now off at college. She's at uh, Colorado State University. I'm sure you're an amazing dad. And I have a similar story. My dad passed away in 2011. And the last thing he said to me is, you know, I was, I was with him in the hospital and he said, you know, go home to your family. You have a family to care for. So uh, sort of a similar story. So Troy, I want to ask you about the industry that you're in, the entertainment industry, and how do you think it's going to look 10 years from now? Well, I'm really hoping that I'll be able to direct more and more by that time. You know, when I was younger, it was my dream to be a director, actually. But it was really hard, of course, uh, not being so many opportunities for a deaf director. And so I'm hoping to develop some scripts that I'd like to direct by that time. And so I can have hearing and deaf actors work together. And it's really important that hearing people will be able to have that awareness and that experience of working with deaf folks. And as far as the entertainment industry in general, I'd really like to see more, more deaf writers, more deaf directors, deaf stuntmen, deaf PAs, uh, all of the above. I think it's really important that we establish workshops so that deaf folks can learn their craft. Um, there's really a gap in a lot of colleges and universities don't really have access uh, for the deaf or the disabled. So I'm really hoping we establish some workshops and some programs for our young deaf folks and our young disabled folks. So they can, we can begin to create this pipeline so they can actually work in the film industry. You know, I taught, I did workshops uh, for theater, dance, and combat back when I was younger with so many great, uh, great teachers. We did poetry, we did improv, we did acting, you name it. 
Um, and that those experiences and those workshops really helped me develop my craft as an actor and really hone that craft. And so there's a big gap out there. So that's what I'm hoping for is that we can establish these workshops. I'm just looking for the money. I'm looking for a budget. So if you know anybody, let me know. I will. Um, is there anything, uh, any exciting projects uh, for you in the future that you uh, have the liberty to talk about? So I went to the Curb Your Enthusiasm premiere the other night. And I'm one of the guest stars that will be in the last season. And so episode three of Curb Your Enthusiasm, I will be appearing in, which is exciting. I've been a big fan for many years. And we had several extremely humorous moments. And that'll be out later on this month, uh, my episode in Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I just completed an independent film called In Cold Light that hopefully will be released in the fall. And then I have another TV series where I'm a reoccurring guest star that I can't announce quite yet. Of course, we were on hold because of all the strikes. Now the strikes are settled. We'll be back to work pretty soon. Well, I wish you all the best of luck. Is there anything I didn't ask that you want me to, that you want to talk about? Well, it's just important for everyone out there who want to include a deaf storyline or a deaf actor. I like saying this, nothing about us without us. And so I'd like everyone to keep that in mind. I think that's a great message for everyone out there to keep in mind, to work together. Well, thank you, Troy Kotzer, for being my guest on All About Change. It was a great discussion and I wish you to go from success to success. And I'm sure we'll see you on the screen many times in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it, Jay. And thank you to our interpreter and thank you to your crew. It was a great chat today and hopefully we can have another chat soon in the future. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Troy Kotzer is a rare talent with his acting abilities matched only by his welcoming spirit. I can't wait to see what he does next. Special thanks to Troy's interpreter, Justin Maurer, for his help with this interview. That's it for today's episode. Join us two weeks from today for my talk with longtime television journalist and author Jane Velez Mitchell. Au revoir, but not good.